Well, hello and welcome to Texas Cooking Today. On this episode, we're gonna be discussing how to equip a kitchen. Now, I'm not gonna tell you brand names to buy, and I'm not gonna give you the obvious stuff that everybody else teaches you. What I'm gonna do is show you a couple of new things that maybe you've never considered before, and a new way of purchasing your equipment. All right, so maybe uh, I'm gonna bring out some information that you were not aware of, and I'm going to make it as clear as possible on the best way to purchase kitchen equipment. So I'll tell you what, let's take a look over my kitchen. And if you'll notice, most of my stuff is always hand tools, all right? There's not a lot of electrics involved in Texas Cooking Today. Texas Cooking Today wants to show you that you don't have to have expensive equipment to have every meal that you could ever desire. All right, so it's all about simplicity, not spending too much money, getting the very best quality on the market, and, well, having an excellent, well-equipped kitchen. So what I wanna teach you is just how to uh, kind of approach it, the things that you're gonna to wanna to purchase first, the things that you're gonna to wanna to put off till down the road, and we're also going to discuss the need for kitchen gadgets. There's a lot of little things out there that most of them aren't really needed and I'm going to explain why. Okay, so let's go over this way and uh, we're gonna take a close look at some of the cookware. So come over here, let me pull down some cookware and let's get a good gander. <laughs> discuss pans for a moment. When it comes to pans, what are you really looking for in a pan? Some people are looking for non-stick coating. If you'll notice, not a single pan that I have has a non-stick coating. And I'm going to make something perfectly clear right now. If you don't want your food to stick, all you have to do is learn how to use your pans the right way. You don't have to worry about food sticking if you do that. And that's what I teach on my show is the right way to use your pans so you don't have food stuck to the pan. So, good stainless set is the first thing I recommend to anybody. Um, cast iron is also very good. Uh, the aluminum I'm not so fond of because it uh, can sometimes impart flavors from the aluminum into the food. Um, and it is a bit softer, but it is commonly used in commercial cooking. Um, the pan that I have here is a very com common household uh, brand name. Uh, this is just a Cuisinart pan. And I'm not going to tout certain brands, but I want to just sort of help you to understand that when it comes to names, names mean very little in the world of quality, okay? It's uh, all about selling flash and shiny uh, bobs and beads when it comes to the pans that are on the market for average home use. Now let me explain what I'm talking about. Even though these are pretty decent pans and they do cook for uh, well for me, um, this brand has an even heat dispersal and all that. One of the problems I ran into it was with soft metal. Now here I have a dented edge on this guy and that didn't happen by any reason other than the pan was knocked off of its perch and it landed on the floor and just that caused a dent in the edge of it. And I thought, wow, that's really kind of pathetic. And after that happened, I started thinking, you know, maybe I should go out and really start researching pans. And what I decided to do was just to purchase fry pans. You know, that way I could get a good comparison overall of overall quality and how the pan is going to react, how it's going to handle itself in different situations. I'm very rough on pans, I won't lie. Uh, I bang the spoon against it a lot. I uh, use the um, um, spatulas against them. Uh, there is the use of the whisk against it. So there's a lot of metal on metal wear that goes on inside my pans. But I want them to have a good strong edge and to hold up. Now what I did start doing after I started shopping around for pans is I bought multiple different ones. Here's one that I purchased. 
And after getting it, it didn't take me long to notice the dents in the bottom of it where my spoon had struck it. And I thought, wow, that's some pretty soft metal. Later on, after it had been in the oven for a bit, the whole pan sort of warped a little bit. So its, it's shape is no longer totally uniform. Even though this is a common brand name and considered to be a very good brand of pan, the quality of this pan really isn't that good. And again, it was due to those soft metals. So I didn't, you know, though I thought I, I had really found a good line of pans here, it turns out it wasn't so hot simply because it just didn't stand the rigors of cooking in my kitchen. And that um, really was disappointing because I thought I had a nice option here on a uh, bottom clad pan. Now, if you'll notice, most of my pans are just that. They're bottom clad, they're not fully clad. Fully clad means that this clad layer here comes all the way up the side to that top edge. And uh, my pans, I don't spend the money for fully clad pans. Those are extremely expensive. Um, there is a very popular brand name that um, you can purchase that's a fully clad pan, very, very good quality pans. However, most people can't afford those. So I decided to look a different direction, and that's this guy, and this. There's a whole bunch of pans I have like this. Now if you'll notice, this one doesn't have that riveted handle that's common on so many pans. Hey, they sell you to look for that riveted handle, right? Good quality right there. And it's true, that rivet handle really holds up well. However, being that this pan cost just a little bit less than this pan and yet is twice as heavy. It has sides that don't bend. The bottom doesn't get dented when I hit it. Neither does this, same thing here. Very strong sides. Now these are commercial pans, folks. You go to a commercial cooking supply either in town, you just go to a restaurant supply, or you can go online to restaurant supplies and commercial cooking supplies. You don't have to be a business to purchase from them, okay? They'll gladly sell to pretty much anybody that's got a dollar to spend. This way you get pans that are built for real heavy work, serious kitchen work, okay? And pans that you know that are gonna hold up. Okay, that's a neat way of doing this. You're going to spend less money, get better quality pans. Now here we have one that, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have that riveted handle. But being that it's only going to cost me $22 to replace this, that's not going to really hurt my feelings if in 10 years that handle comes off, all right? What I'm worried about is, is it going to get beat up and dented up and, and, and mauled in the process of waiting for that handle to fall off, if it ever does. Now remember, that's a kitchen uh, attachment for commercial use, so it's well built, it's well attached. You can get better quality than this brand, okay? Uh, there is a higher quality commercial kitchen cookware that won't cost you as much as the top line uh, on home cookware, but is far, far heavier and more durable. Now that's pretty much all I wanted to go into on cookware. As far as the materials that you purchase, the brand name that you buy, that's up to you. But what I'm going to say is if you want to test them out by skillets, you know, fry pans, test them that way and be abusive on them and find out the truth. Um, the one I mentioned that warped earlier, this one, well, that pan, it warped when it was in the oven. It couldn't handle heat. And that's really sad. I should be able to put any one of my pans in the oven and it handle heat without problems. Make sure you get durability and thick walls. Now, I did mention earlier that fully clad thing, and it's wonderful, okay, because it transfers uh, any lost heat that would come up off the side and be lost out the bottom down here it transfers it right up the side and keeps it in the pot, okay? So it's very energy efficient. At least look for a pan that does have a cladding on the bottom of some kind, okay? This nice cladding holds heat and it spreads that heat out more evenly and you get more even cooking, okay? Really important, especially on pans like this where you're looking to fry and get an even browning on that, uh, whatever it is that you're cooking. Now these nonstick coatings, well, people have asked me many times, what do you think about nonstick coatings? And I tell them the truth. I think very, very little of nonstick coatings, okay? Nonstick coatings are really just sort of, they're kind of problematic. 
Now here's sort of the problem I have with nonstick coatings, guys. When it comes to nonstick coatings, okay, you remember the old stories about how miners would keep a canary in a cage down in the mine. And if the canary died, well, that means the miners needed to get out of there and they needed to get out quick, okay? So the reason is, is that you cannot smell methane gas. It is odorless. It's colorless, odorless, and it's deadly. Now, if that bird died, then frankly, it was a dangerous situation. The problem is, is that if you have birds, you already know you don't use nonstick cookware because nonstick cookware, the minute you cook with it, is going to kill your birds. So it becomes very difficult to buy like baking ware because most baking ware that you find these days has some sort of nonstick coating on that. And the gas that it releases when you cook with it will kill a bird. Now they say it's non-toxic to humans. Okay, fine, dandy, but it still kind of concerns me that it's killing anything in the process. So I don't like it for that reason. I also don't like it for the fact that it flakes and rubs off over time. And I wonder, gee, where do those flakes go to? Are they in my food? Am I eating them? And are they affecting me? Okay, so a long time ago when I was a really young cook, I tried these coatings out and these things crossed my mind and things I learned about them and I decided to abandon that and stick strictly with good old-fashioned stainless and proper cooking techniques. If you don't want your food to stick in stainless, all you have to do is preheat it before you put the food in it and it will cause caramelization, your food will release and there's not a problem. That's how that is uh, done. Now let's move on to utensils. Now let's take a moment to discuss these utensils. These are sort of the basic cooking equipment, cooking utensils that you're going to be using on a regular and daily basis if you're cooking every day for yourself. I recommend on this stuff, again, not to spend a fortune. Don't go out and buy the finest, most expensive, pretty handled items. What you're looking for here is gauge, okay? And what I mean by gauge, that would be that thickness of that metal. Also, is the metal broken like this one? You see this bend in the middle. It gives much more rigidity to the spoon, so it will not bend on that handle. Uh, again, this is a commercial spoon, very inexpensive item. I think I paid all of $2.95 for this guy. Uh, do not spend a whole lot of money, but look for good strength. Try to bend that handle and see if it's going to uh, not hold up for you. Find out early on if you've got a good item if you've, or if you have a cheap item. Some things are designed to have some flex to them though. Uh, turners like this, especially these commercial turners, do have a bit of flex and they are meant to have that flex and that way they can work on a flat grill a whole lot easier. Uh, these are great on a flat grill and also out on a uh, charcoal grill. They do really well. Um, the most commonly used item I know of in the kitchen, and you're going to need more of these than anything else, these are your tongs, okay? Tongs and turners do a lot of work in the kitchen along with the spoon. These are the things that you manipulate food while they're in pans or in, in or on heat sources. And uh, you're going to also be needing from time to time, pardon me as I reach across here, some extra long ones, especially if you have a grill. These are very handy and when you need to get your fingers, your knuckles back from the flames uh, or from the heat and you want something that you're not going to get burned with, having these extra long items is very nice. Tongs that are extra long, they also reach into ovens really well and they pull out pans. So if you want to have, you know, like a hot pad in one hand and some tongs in the other, it's a good way to pull things out of the oven. Here's another type of turner, and I brought both of these out so that I could demonstrate an important point about these things. Uh, first of all, good turners don't have a blade that's riveted to the handle, so you want to avoid that. You want a, a good continuous blade that comes up into the handle itself or through the handle. Like this has, the blade comes all the way up through that handle and is riveted in place, or the wood handle is riveted onto the blade itself, really. This one just has a solid one-piece construction, which is really nice. They're both quite uh, sturdy, all right? I purchased this one for 
important reason. In the kitchen, a lot of times, especially when you're cooking for yourself or it's just two people cooking, uh, then you're going to be needing smaller pans. Reaching into a narrow fry pan with something like this is very difficult because of its length of the blade. So finding one with a shorter blade is a very handy thing, you see here? And having a little bit longer handle I find very comfortable. So that's the reason I chose this when I purchased it. It doesn't look like anything else, but it had all of the right qualifications. So that's the reason I bought it. And again, didn't spend a whole lot for it. Found that one at a box store. Now, something that you might want to consider when you get around to kneading it would be a masher. This is really nice for mashing like avocado dips. You can do uh, mashed potatoes with these, but it doesn't work as well as the uh, food mill. The food mill actually produces a fluffier version. You will need some whisks. I recommend something like this, which is a medium large whisk. This handles a lot of the heavy duty stuff in the kitchen. You don't need the thick tines. The light tines like this work really well and they'll fluff egg and cream and things like that very, very quickly. They'll also mix soups quite quickly. This one and one about half of this size is really nice because that handles sauce as well. The two of them uh, have served me for literally decades and they do well. So just get a decent whisk, again, not a lot of money, and some strainers like this. Um, I would say at least two, maybe three. I have a, a triple set. There's a large, medium, and small, and this is the medium size. On these, again, we're looking at the gauge of the handle. Does it have something to allow it to sit on the pot? The curvature of this is specifically designed to allow it to set on the edge of a pot so that I don't have to hold it when I'm pouring liquids through it uh, or something like that. Makes it a lot more convenient. So look for these little details like this. Now there is an item that's frequently used uh, in a lot of people's kitchens. They go out and spend extra money for it and they don't need to. They buy a meat mallet. If you have a little skillet, guess what? You've got a meat mallet. It's right there. Okay, so don't be afraid to use this when you're needing to uh, pound out meat or tenderize meat. This works every bit as well and I use this frankly uh, a great deal more for uh, pounding out meat than I do for frying anything up. So handy little skillet does two things for me. And the very last tool that we have is sitting in the back there. It's a very humble little tool. If you don't make bread or things like that, it probably won't matter to you. But this little guy is simply a, a, a pastry knife. Okay, and it, all it's designed to do is to cut through pastries and breads and stuff. It's not sharp on the edge. Uh, and it's also good for scraping clean boards. So very handy little item for cleaning a board up and scraping it clean. Um, but something that you're not really going to need in the kitchen right off. This is one of those items that you buy kind of down the road. The stuff you need right off, your whisks, spoons, tongs, turners, and strainers. That comes first. Okay, there it is, folks. Very simple, good information, no brands touted, just a good way of looking at what you need to get. There's a pan rack here. Okay, now pan racks, what some people call cooling racks, uh, and they are used for that also. A pan rack like this is something that uh, can be used in the base of like a uh, um, baking pan or something like that when you're baking in the oven. It'll raise the food off of the bottom of the pan. It will uh, also allow you to steam food in a shallow pan. You can roast like a bird on top of that inside of a, a basic, like a cake pan even. So they're very, very practical for many different things. Uh, so get yourself some pan racks. Those are super. I have a large griddle. Now, do you really need a, a two burner griddle? Well, usually not. I use that when I'm gonna be cooking out, like on camp outs and things, and I'm cooking for a lot of people, or I wanna do all of the breakfast for like say uh, two to four people on one single item. The griddle is great, and I love that thing. All right, now, Let's move on to other things such as measuring utensils and bowls. Okay, now let's go into bowls. 
Now bowls are essential in a kitchen. You're going to be doing all kinds of things and bowls are absolutely mandatory, okay? You're going to be mixing, turning, stirring, and all kinds of stuff. So basic sets of bowls are very smart to buy. There's a lot of different ones out there. You can get plastic ones, ceramic, glass, stainless, uh, even uh, I've seen some aluminum. It's not common, but they're there. I really favor the stainless. I like them because they clean easy. They're very lightweight, easy to handle. Uh, and the sets that I have also have some snap-in lids that I really like. They're pretty cool. Uh, I have combination of some commercial ones here and some uh, ones that are made for home use, but they were very heavy, good quality. So look around. Now on those stainless ones, you're just looking for heavier gauge stainless. Good thing to do little bowls to measure things in because we do what we call the setup method on Texas cooking today you'll need lots of different bowls, bowls to measure your ingredients in and that's very handy all right it's uh, called the French setup method and frankly it makes cooking a lot easier now I don't think you need to restrict yourself to just one kind of bowl and there's good reasons Let's take a yeast, for example. Yeast does not react well with metal. You want to keep it, like if you're rising bread, don't rise bread in a metal uh, bowl. It just, it's, it's not a good idea. You want to rise bread in a glass bowl, all right? And the glass bowl, the, the yeast will not react with, and you'll get good rising on the bottom of the loaf the same way you do on the top. So better activity. Also, you can see through these bowls and they're a little bit prettier when you put them out for uh, you know, people to dip food out of. Very nice for that. So anyway, not much more to say about bowls except just think about variety and quantity. I can never say that I've had too many bowls. I've always had times in my life when I thought, gee, I could use a few extra. So <laughs> get yourself plenty. Now, the other thing I mentioned that we wanted to do was to look at measuring items. Things that are good for measuring. Let me reach up here and get some measuring cups. These are typical measuring cups. They generally come in sets of four, so that way you have a one cup and a half cup, a third cup, and a quarter cup generally. And uh, my set also has an eighth cup. These things are inexpensive. They're absolutely essential in the kitchen for if you're gonna be working with recipes and uh, most people that are uh, learning to cook definitely were working with recipes, so you're gonna have to have measuring utensils. These only cost a couple of dollars. These are the same way. You don't have to get expensive uh, measuring spoons. I've been using this type of measuring spoon to measure dry ingredients for the last 20 years, and I think this is my third set of these. So don't spend a lot of money on these things. You don't have to. They don't need to be expensive. I think I spent like all of two dollars for that, maybe three, okay? In the same way on these. On your uh, liquid measure, you can go with glass, you can go with plastic. They all work really well. There are some that have some really neat benefits, like this one. You don't have to bend down and look at the side of the, the dish to, or excuse me, uh, the measuring cup in order to see how much you have in there, like you would with this one. This has a measuring gauge on the inside. All you have to do is look down in it and it's very, very accurate. So I've learned to use these, I love them. Now, let's reach back here. I've got some other measuring devices. These measure temperature. In the kitchen, you're gonna to want to control everything. And measuring and controlling temperature is important. Again, don't spend a lot of money on these things. This is a candy deep fry thermometer. I don't find this very effective because it needs to be in a lot of oil to read well. This one, if the tip of it is in the oil, it's going to give you a good accurate reading. However, it's glass, easy to break, and if you overheat it, it's going to blow its top, okay? Meat thermometer to keep yourself from overcooking meats and to get them done perfect. Also, chef's thermometer, which you can use instead of this, uh, but you have to take the roast out of the oven, put this in there, and give it time for a reading. Now, last but not least, when it comes to measuring, is weight measures. This is very common throughout most of the world 
to do weight measures. So a lot of the recipes that you're going to find, especially those from Europe and those from Asia, are all going to be done by weights, okay? So you're going to have so many grams of flour and so many grams of sugar and, and so forth and so on. And that's how they measure a lot of stuff, okay? So if you have a scale, then you can do that. Again, doesn't take a hundred dollar scale folks all right i went out searching for an inexpensive one i found it it was a nice quality did everything i wanted to do twenty dollars okay don't break the bank on any of this stuff you don't have to good kitchen has to do more with what you know and the tools that you have not with how much you spent for those tools all right okay let's move on to our next segment our next segment we want to talk about food processing and food processing equipment okay now if you'll notice I have a stack of these beautiful colored boards out here these are all cutting boards okay and that's sort of the basis and the beginning of food processing food processing the basics of it happens with knives and cutting boards are essential to use with knives you can use wooden cutting boards or plastic ones, okay? Avoid those glass cutting boards. They are really good for dulling your knife edges. And frankly, it's just not needed. It's a, not a good kitchen item. It's, um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to any of us. So uh, those of us in the, in, in the kitchen business, in the cooking business, we look at those things and we wonder, what the heck were they thinking? Okay, so big cutting boards like the wooden wood I have down here on the bottom uh, or these and the plastic ones. And I recommend when you're buying cutting boards, get as big a cutting board as you can find. The reason being, it's a lot easier to work on that extra space than having to work on a little teeny tiny space. Okay, get a decent cutting board even if it's only one. And remember, when you're only using one uh, cutting board, to distinguish one side from the other. One side for meats, the other side for vegetables. If you want to be really safe and sanitary, you use the color-coded system. Fruits and vegetables, cooked meats, any kind of cooked meat, whether it's seafood, poultry, uh, red meats, or whatever. These three boards, the red, yellow, and blue, are for raw meats only. Raw red meats, lamb, pork, beef, that kind of stuff goes on the red board. Poultry, if it flies in the air, it goes on the yellow board. Blue, if it swims in water, it goes on the blue board. It's just that simple, folks. It looks like water, it's blue. Yellow reminds you of the yellow fat on a chicken, all right? And red is the color that, that you see when you're cutting red meat, okay? So very easy to distinguish. Now, what would white be? Very simple. That is going to be for your cheeses and also for doing, uh, uh, well, dairy and bakery. So like if you're going to cut biscuits, you cut them on the white board. If you're going to slice cheese, you do it on the white board, okay? Why do all of that? That's all about sanitation, folks. You don't get cross-contamination. If I process shrimp on this blue board and then cut my meat that's been cooked on this brown board, I'm not going to cross-contaminate that cooked meat with the shrimp that I put on the blue board because, well, we've avoided cross-contamination through using two different ones. Multiple boards are very handy for that. Even if you go with the wood ones, get multiples. That way you have a safer kitchen. It's about cross-contamination and not giving yourself food poisoning. Knives. Do you need to spend a bundle on knives? do you need to go cheap on knives? Actually, neither. You can go inexpensive. This is a knife that's made in Canada and it has a high carbon steel blade, uh, meaning that it rusts very easily. However, it also has another quality. You can make it sharp, very, very, very sharp because of that high carbon steel sharpens very well. It takes an edge well. That's really the trick to whether a knife is good or not. How well does it take an edge? Do you have to spend a week sharpening it to get it sharp again, or can you do it in a minute? Now, every knife I have can be sharpened in one minute, all right? And I do them once a week, one minute per knife, I'm finished with them. And it, they're always about three times sharper than razor blades. I keep my knives freakishly sharp because they're safer that way. Now, 
these knives that you see that are supposedly have a lifetime edge on them. You might want to avoid that kind of thinking, folks. Those little laser edge knives that you see that they've sold on TV for years, those things do not cut very well. All right, they cut poorly, they're jagged, they tear the food more than they actually cut the food. What you need is just a good set of knives that will take a good edge and then get yourself a sharpening stone to sharpen those knives with. I have here top of the line, this is a Japanese knife that uh, will take a fine edge. Fantastic knife. I love cooking with it, but you don't have to have this. Any good quality knife is going to cut it for you. I recommend uh, those that you don't have to spend a bundle on, but are sharpenable. So make sure you don't get the laser edge. And ceramic knives, well, well, the jury is still out on those, okay? But my understanding is, is once they're dull, they're not easy to sharpen. Uh, and uh, that while they're kind of cute and pretty and they have nice pretty colors, they're not as practical as a nice good old fashioned hardened steel knife, all right? So knives, very important. Peelers, things like this. Get yourself a grater. Again, inexpensive items. These things do your food processing wonderfully. But as I mentioned earlier, you can fill that kitchen up with gadgets and junk so quick it'll make your head spin. Let me give you an example right back here. This is a meat tenderizer. Does it work? Heck yeah, it works. It's a wonderful little goodie. All those knives. So, it tenderizes meat wonderfully, both the base pounding, heavy spring loaded, as well as the knives that separate the meat fibers from their connective tissue. Very handy. But, necessary? Heck no. You can do the same thing with the bottom of a skillet. You can pound down that meat and make it tender with that. Okay, or you can use a meat mallet. Kitchen gadgets just aren't that needed. Even the meat mallet's not needed. If you own a, a fry pan, you've got something you can beat meat with. Now, here's another item. This is called a mandolin. Mandolins are good for professionals. However, in the hands of somebody that's inexperienced, they're a good way to get sent to OR, uh, having to get your fingers stitched back together because people frequently run their hands across these and it will slice you wide open. This is an extremely dangerous gadget. I don't recommend it for anybody. Uh, it cuts beautiful french fries, yes, but is it safe? Not really, not really that very safe. Now, one other type of kitchen gadget I want to mention, and that's these items that you push food through. And it's a processing item. One is like this. This guy here is what's called a ricer. You have in the bottom a plate, and then you put food in the cup. The plunger forces the food down through the sieve, okay? Very simple. Also, and I find this one more practical, does the same thing. It takes food, you put it down in here, and the paddle, when you turn it, forces food down through the sieve. This comes with three different sizes of sieves, okay? Food mills are inexpensive. You can get these for as low as $20. I've seen them also as high as $500. For God's sake, don't spend that kind of money. This one was under $100, and it's a commercial type. It's, it's extra large, wide bell type that'll hold a lot of food. Mashed potatoes, nothing makes better mashed potatoes than these, okay? So get one of these, it'll make your sauces, it'll make your mashed potatoes, it'll make your applesauce, everything is fantastic. No electrics needed, folks. If you've noticed, I didn't tell you about getting a food processor, I didn't tell you about getting a blender, none of that, all right? So the thing of it is, is when you're first equipping your kitchen, don't focus on electrics. They're not that important. Get the little stuff like this, these processing items, your grater, your knives, your cutting boards. Those are the things that are going to make a difference in whether or not you can prepare a meal or not. Okay? Now, I'll tell you what, let's move on to our next segment. All right, guys, I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about bakeware. Now, bakeware is the kind of thing where if you bought everything out there, you will spend an absolute fortune. On your bakeware. I would say purchase bakeware as you need it, okay? If you decide you're going to start making some homemade pizzas, well that's when it's time to go out and buy you some pizza pans, okay? And you pick out whatever kind of pizza pan you want, purchase those things, and then you're off and set and ready to make pizzas. Then you'll have your pizza pans. These don't cost a whole lot, 
you know, for a nice set of these, I didn't spend more than about, I think it was uh, $6 for the set. And I got two of them. So, very worthy purchase. All kinds of cake pans. You can go fancy bunk pans like this or just something very basic like square or round cake pans. What you do with a cake after it comes out of this, when you layer it and things like that and decorate it, then it becomes special. The pan itself isn't that fancy. Sometimes the pan's very fancy. This one's what they call a, a vaulted dome pan. It's really cool, it makes a gorgeous cake, but, well, it's just not the kind of thing you're gonna use every day, all right? So why would you go out and buy this unless you're actually wanting to cook a cake that looks like that, okay? So no sense in doing something like that. Sheet pan's probably the most common pan that you're gonna ever use in a kitchen. I use them for all kinds of things. Baking cookies, wonderful. Baking crackers, you can cook pizza on these, by the way. You don't have to have a pizza pan. You can just own some of these and make your pizzas either small round or oval or even square. It doesn't really matter. Here you have what's called a pan rack. I told you about these a little earlier, how practical they are. Okay, you can put uh, let's say if I wanted to cook some game hens, I would put two of these on here. I could put one, two, three, four, five, six good sized game hens on this one pan, put some fluid in the bottom, and roast those things up beautifully with only a sheet pan and two of these. I didn't have to go out and buy an expensive roaster, I just had to use my head and have sensible items in my kitchen. So, get good quality when it comes to this stuff. It'll last you for a long time, but also bakeware doesn't cost a lot. It's just that there's a lot of different kinds of it. Get it as you need it. Buy your casserole dish when you need that. Uh, buy your muffin dishes when you need those. Um, and that way you kind of collect it over time and you'll have yourself a nice set of bakeware, okay? Now, nonstick coatings versus uh, regular pans when it comes to bakeware. Good luck finding bakeware that doesn't have a nonstick coating. You can uh, purchase from a commercial supply and you'll get either aluminum or steel with no coating on them. But if you're looking at any other place, I've never seen uh, places that sell stuff, you know, box stores that sell baking pans anymore that don't have some sort of nonstick coating on them. Some of them are very advanced and very good quality coatings. But again, you're gonna run into problem if you have birds, okay? so. While I'm sort of stuck having to use nonstick coating on my uh, bakeware, I don't have to if I don't want to. I can still season these over. I can rub oil onto the whole thing, put it in the oven, and form a caramelized layer across this pan of, of oil. And that caramelized uh, layer of oil is what we used to refer to as seasoning a pan. You do that with cast ironware and other stuff that will, that will rust, like steel cookware that's not stainless. Once it has that coating on it and it turns kind of a beautiful brown color, then your pan is non-stick, plus it won't release anything, okay? So kind of a neat way of doing it. Uh, also, one last thing, you can use this pan with some of these to during grease. That's right, when you're finished cooking fried chicken or whatever, you put your fried chicken or your fried shrimp or whatever right on top of this, it drips the grease down onto this lower pan and it's an easy cleanup later. You don't waste any paper towels. That's the way it would be done in a restaurant, folks. They have a special draining area for fried foods. Now guys, there's some other items that you're gonna to wanna to consider also once you've purchased your basics, your pots, pans, spoons, knives, things like that. Other items that really make working in the kitchen so much easier. And at the same time, you're not gonna spend just a whole lot of money on them. These items that you see right here, a simple torch, okay? This thing does all kinds of different jobs in the kitchen. And in time, as your cooking experience grows, you'll really understand that. Don't be in a rush to get this though. Get it once it's time to need it, okay? If, if you're about to do a creme brulee, that's when you need to go buy your torch, okay? And don't spend much money on it, okay? Just get a basic torch with the push button start, a release valve, and uh, you don't have to go anything stronger than propane, okay? Anything hotter than that. That's for uh, doing work on pipes and stuff. Go to the hardware store, get one of these, and don't spend much money on those high dollar ones that you see in kitchen supplies. A basic rolling pin, very handy, does a lot of work in the kitchen, okay? Rolling pin can be used for many different things. 
This is what's called a pastry blender. It's just made for mixing together items such as pie dough and doing other pastries. Some scissors, get you some scissors for your kitchen. This is a, um, a mortar and pestle and wonderful item for grinding up whatever that you want to grind up. And believe me, there's times when you'll want to grind stuff up. Good example, you buy rosemary. It comes like a bunch of little dried twigs. Those are rosemary leaves actually, but they don't cook down very well. And who wants a bunch of twigs in the food they're eating? So you put those twigs inside of a, uh, a device like this, mill it around for a few minutes. The next thing you know, you've got a nice powder to flavor your uh, food with rosemary and you don't have twigs in it anymore. Get you a bottle opener, something to baste with. These come in many forms. They're all fine and dandy and they're all cheap. A disher, some people call it an ice cream scoop. Get yourself some dishers, okay? Wonderful items to have spatulas okay this folks is a spatula what you saw earlier that metal thing is called a turner all right so if you go to a commercial cooking supply and you ask for spatulas you're going to get these um, if you ask for spatulas thinking you're going to get something metal that turns a hamburger patty over you're going to be grossly disappointed with it because they don't sell spatulas they sell turners get yourself a sharpening stone absolutely essential for any kitchen that goes with the knife set, folks. It should be purchased at the same time. You can buy these in a hardware store. This is a diamond uh, impregnated type, and it sharpens my knives just so very quick and easy. It does a beautiful job of it. There you go, basic goodies to add to your kitchen set. Doesn't cost a whole lot. Don't get expensive electrics, folks, and don't buy a bunch of weird little gadgets. Is there anything I forgot? Well, I believe there was. Get yourself a colander, okay? Great thing. Put vegetables or whatever in here to wash them. You cook pasta, you just pour it off with the water right into this. Water drains off, your pasta's ready to cook or use. They're handy for a lot of stuff. Get yourself a colander. Don't spend a lot, okay? I hope that, uh, that this short series on how to equip a kitchen was helpful for you. I hope that um, it filled in some of the gaps for you. And if it didn't, well, please leave, leave, uh, leave me a comment in the uh, comment section below. Let me know what you're looking for and maybe I can produce a film on that. Thank you very much for watching. And I would like to say to my subscribers, thank you very, very much for subscribing. And you folks, well, you have a good day. Hey guys, thank you for watching Texas Cooking Today. Do appreciate it. If you would, please subscribe. If you like this, just click like down there. And if you would, I would really appreciate it if you add me to your favorites. Thank you.